Hello friends, welcome back to Currently Workshopping, a show where we work through the perils and frisson of being alive together. This week will be a full Q&A episode. I have read the comments about podcasts being less scripted, which I totally hear you on. So here it is, I swear, a less scripted episode, although I will admit that I prepped a little beforehand because, well, I get too anxious otherwise. As a reminder, this is the penultimate episode this season, and next episode will be a return to my beloved researched personal essay. Then I'll be taking a hard look at all of my efforts and endeavors, but don't worry, I'm definitely not leaving podcasting. I love video essays, so we'll be spending some time watching some on YouTube in preparation for creating my own. If you have any favorite video essayists, like drop them in the comments below and I'll check them out. I've also been speaking with a potential co-host about doing a podcast together next year, and it's actually looking like we'll be launching something new together. So Sifty XXX, your review is read and understood. By adding a conversation into thought-provoking topics, I'll definitely speak slower and more conversationally, which should give listeners time to digest what we're talking about. Thank you so much for your thoughtful review, and I hope that this new podcast that I'm launching will address a lot of those concerns, so please stay tuned for that. And if you don't already follow me on Instagram or subscribe to my Substack, please do at the links down below, as those are the first platforms on which I'll announce new projects. I'm really, really excited for the new podcast that I'm putting together with my co-host. I guarantee it's something you don't want to miss when it launches early next year. Okay, so for this episode, I tried to split up the questions into general categories so that I could do timestamps for y'all and you can just go to whatever categories interest you the most. The categories I divided the questions into were first, law, second, work, three, life strategies and frameworks, and then fourth, general questions about me. Thanks so much for submitting these, and I really hope that you get something out of my responses. And now let's get into the Q&A. Okay, first category, law. And I'll be answering these questions kind of in like reverse chronological order because I got questions about all stages of trying to pursue a legal career from like where I'm at to way, way, way before. The first question is, Do you regret leaving big law? So if you had asked me in any of the months before my book deal, I may have said yes, because I was just really, really anxious about having left a fairly stable career and a fairly stable paycheck. I think there's something really safe about corporations, maybe. I think that's how our parents operated. I think that's very common for the older generation where, you know, you had a job at the same corporation for like 20 years and then you got promoted and then if you stay for like 40 years, um, 45 years, then you retired and you got like a nice pension. So I think there's like almost like a societal comfort around working for corporations and, you know, partnerships. Uh, Big law is a corporation. In my entire life, I would say I really did always pick the safe route, right? Like I was like, okay, I will focus a lot on school. I will make sure that I get good grades. I will do whatever teachers tell me to do. Uh, I really want to prioritize grades and school in my life. Even though I had classmates who were definitely like, I care about the classes I care about. I don't care about the classes I don't care about. And I actually just want to like learn programming, which given the era in which I graduated from high school would have been an awesome decision because they would have got into like the tech boom at the start. But alas, and I think that's kind of where I'm coming from is like, I have seen my peers take risks, right? Like one of my good friends from freshman year at Yale, he actually dropped out of Yale in freshman year to pursue a startup. He was like one of the Peter Thiel fellows, like 20 under 20, I think. And at that time, I was like so floored that he would even do that. I was just like, why would you ever drop out of college? Why would you ever drop out of Yale? And it really made no sense to me. And I think that same sense of wanting to stay safe led me to law school, right? Because I could have graduated and then taken on some job after college, worked for a few years before law school. But after I hated my consulting internship, I just really didn't know what to do. And honestly, I think a lot of people feel that way about graduating college and going forth into the world. Like it is kind of scary, just like don't know what to do. And law school in that way kind of seemed like a safe choice. So my entire life, I've kind of like done the safe, stable choice. And this past March really was like the first time where I took a risk somewhat in leaving something that is like traditionally seen as safe and stable. So for the entire like what, 
eight months where I was working on my book deal, didn't know what was going on, I really probably was like, man, can I go back? Should I go back? And I guess that also helped me too, right? It wasn't like I left big law and I was like, okay, well, I can never go back. Like I very much can go back. And that also that like backup plan, that helped me feel a little bit safer about leaving. So while I didn't regret leaving big law at the time because I knew I could always go back to it, I still like felt some type of way. I was like, is this a stupid idea? After getting my book deal though, I will say that I definitively do not regret leaving big law. In general, I am trying to be a little bit more risky with myself in my career. And this isn't to say that I won't go back to law or even big law. The whole idea of this, like knowing that I could leave big law and return within two years was to set up a time frame to figure it out, right? I wanted to either succeed within two years or fail within two years. And then that would give me some information and if I gave it a shot, I gave it a shot. And then I can always go back. Like I loved my firm. I loved my group. There was just like a lot to love. So the downsides were pretty minimal from my perspective. And I think because of that, like there aren't any regrets about what I've done. Okay, the next law question is, what would you tell yourself if you could go back in time to before you started big law? I probably tell myself like, don't forget what my original intentions were. I think one of the difficulties of working in big law is that you work a ton and a ton. Like you just have pretty brutal hours and sometimes work late at night, don't get a lot of sleep. This was especially true during my more junior years. And in that environment, you kind of have to like justify why you're working a ton. Of course, there is student loans and I did pay like $2,000 every month in student loans. But on top of that, I had to kind of justify working a ton and I did spend money to justify working a ton. I think this is kind of like the golden handcuffs that a lot of people talk about. And before you go to law school, I think a lot of people think I couldn't do that. Like I wouldn't turn into that. But once you are in that environment, once you are working at the law firm like that, it gets so easy to... I don't know, at like 2 a.m., you're like exhausted and you know you have to like be awake for a 7 a.m. call and nothing is like happening at work then, but like you're waiting for a document to come over from the other side and you're just like online shopping, right? And you just like buy something. Like it's just very easy to online shop during that time because you have to be awake, you have to be attentive, right? And the only thing that you're really getting from the job that you have too much of really is money. And it's like more money than you've probably ever seen in your life. So I think working in that environment makes it easy to spend a ton to justify working a ton. That environment, I would say, also makes it a lot easier to be pretty like narrow and myopic about what your identity is. At some point I was like, well, you know, what do I do most of the time? I work, I go out, I go to dinner and that's about it. So if someone was like, oh, who are you? I'd be like, well, I'm a lawyer. And I think that's why a lot of people sometimes identify as lawyers. And we do see a lot of people online who are lawyers self-identify as lawyers. I just think it's the nature of the beast and the nature of if you are spending, you know, 10 to 18 hours every day working, yeah, like that is kind of your identity in between the golden handcuffs and then the identity issue. It becomes really hard to think about leaving the job, right? Like I think leaving big law is kind of a difficult choice because you almost feel like you're leaving your identity behind. Even going in house, it feels like a big decision sometimes. Like for me, even though I originally had gone into big law knowing that I wanted to go in house, I just like didn't really think about going in house after a while. I was like, oh, you know, like this is kind of working. I like the people and who would I be if I weren't a big law lawyer? And I just like really didn't know. So that's probably what I would tell myself before going into big law is that big law kind of consumes your identity and also has golden handcuffs. So you have to really remind yourself and it is so hard because it is an environment that is almost intentionally structured to make you forget yourself. All right, next question. How do you recommend getting a big law internship as an undergraduate? So I think it's just really hard to work in big law as an undergrad. Like I didn't know of any interns who were undergrads. In general, big law is a pretty closed off system, which is why I think there's so much interest in knowing what it's like. You just don't really know much about it. And it's very hard to learn about the system without working within it. You can't like shadow a big law lawyer because there's attorney client like confidentiality issues. 
I think the earliest time that you can really try a big law is maybe like a paralegal internship. But I looked at some listings and it seemed like you had to have some kind of like paralegal certification or something like that. And honestly, I just like didn't know a lot of college students who were at any of the firms that I've heard about. However, it is possible in college to get internships in other legal environments, such as like the DA's office, the public defender's office, smaller law firms, but like big law in general. I think the best you can hope for to get information about big law is by talking to big law lawyers. So like reach out to them. They're probably happy to talk to you. Of course, a lot of them will leave you on red, but some of them will be happy to talk to you. Um, but there's really like no good way to get an internship as an undergrad in big law. Okay, next question. Advice for high schoolers who want to go into law. So for this, I would just say like read and write as much as possible, develop your critical reading skills and just talk to different kinds of lawyers as much as you can to get a sense of like which area of law you want to practice in. But don't stress about it too much because you are still so young. Like I think high schoolers who want to go into law, it's good to you know read and write because lawyers really do read and write a lot. But there's not like some, I don't know, skill you have to really adopt right now. There's not like some you know, home run thing that if you do now, you'll like definitely be a great lawyer. So I would say that the bigger thing for high schoolers looking to go into law is to still keep a pretty open mind. I think oftentimes in media, we don't see a lot of jobs, right? Like we see lawyers, doctors, maybe bankers, but there are so many jobs out in the world that we don't see like on screen. And this is one of the areas where I think like social media has helped a ton, right? Is that now we do know what it's like to have certain jobs that weren't available before. Honestly, I wish like people who are like accountants or like sales reps or people who are like supply chain logistics coordinators, I really wish they would show their job too. I think I would have loved being a supply chain logistics coordinator and I probably would have been good at it, but I just never thought about it because I didn't know that those jobs existed. Okay, second category, work. The first question is, how to deal with colleagues that get on your nerves. So I kind of break this up into two categories. There's like the well-intentioned colleagues that get on your nerves. And then there's the malicious colleagues that get on your nerves, right? So if they're well-intentioned, if like they're perfectly nice, they just kind of get on your nerves sometimes. And like, it's more of a you thing than a them thing. Honestly, I just like, smile, be polite, like recognize that they're trying their best and it's just good to be patient. One of my friends told me recently about an Islam principle, principle? I don't know if it's a principle, but um, this, I guess, saying in Islam where before you judge someone, you're supposed to make 70 excuses for them, right? And I really thought that was beautiful. So like if someone seems like really rude to you or something, you're supposed to be like, well, maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe uh, they are really stressed out. Maybe they are dealing with some like real mental health issues right now. Maybe their pet died. Like there's so many things that could be going on to have the interaction be not the way that you want. And I think this in the same way, like if they get on your nerves, but they're well-intentioned, maybe they just like aren't social in the way that you like people to be social. They don't like interact and have the same interpersonal dynamics that you are used to, which is fine. Like that is totally fine. So kind of like, be patient about that. However, if they are malicious, that is a whole other, <laughs> that is a whole other realm. And this is when I would say like, be polite, but don't go out of your way, right? And like, don't necessarily give them the same latitude that you would for someone that you do like. So I try to minimize my interactions with people who seem like malicious when they interact with me. Like either I feel like they're trying to befriend me, to stab me in the back, or they seem like they're trying to one up me or belittle me or condescend. And that happens a lot in the workplace, right? I, I think it just happens a lot if you're young, it happens a lot if you're like a woman of color, especially. But in those situations, um, you know, if even if it's like a partner, I will do tactics such as if they just like call me out of the blue, I might let the call go to my assistant. And then I will gather myself, gather my emotions, like prepare kind of like defensively for what is about to happen. And then call them back like, you know, two minutes later, five minutes later. I think that like two minutes, five minutes to really collect yourself and like put yourself in the mind frame, mind frame, in, in the mindset to really deal with this person who gets on your nerves. It's really helpful for maintaining your own sanity. I wouldn't underestimate the power and mental sanity that comes from engaging with people 
who get on your nerves, but on your own terms, right? I think oftentimes when people get on our nerves or like really make us angry, it's usually because we haven't adopted a mindset that would make that interaction more tolerable. And we're often like kind of bamboozled or feel blindsided by the whole interaction. So yeah, basically don't respond immediately and then create distance with the person, but also don't like flee from them, right? Like they are your colleagues. They do deserve a general level of respect. Okay. Next question in work is how to create work-life balance. So I'd say for a work-life balance, like block off time in your work calendar, right? I think the problem with like work calendars is that they are just for work and they don't reflect any life meetings that you might have. So I actually like to integrate the two a bit more. I, I wouldn't say like, you know, connect your personal calendar and your work calendar, but on your work calendar, I will put in things like every day I would go work out. So I would really block off like seven to nine or like six to eight, depending on what seemed appropriate for that day as just like, I think I put it in my calendar as like self care time, but I wouldn't let people schedule meetings there unless uh, it was really necessary and there wasn't any other option. Make sure to do like one thing for yourself every day, even if it is like working out, making dinner, having a call with your mom or dad, like something of that realm. And I think that like helps a lot. Setting the intention pays off like way more than never setting the intention in the first place. And I think you'd be surprised at how much intention matters in all of this. And I feel like I'm repeating myself with everything being like, oh, intention matters or, oh, mindset matters. But that's like 80% of the battle sometimes with respect to work is really just like a mindset shift. All right, the next question is how to create structure and find motivation in your life while self-employed. I also got a question about like, how do I stay motivated? So I'll just kind of marry these two. I am actually a huge planner. So uh, this is actually my... Uh, 2023 monthly planner. I'll just like put in what I want to do each week and really plan things out in advance, right? And then every week on like Sunday, I'll sit down with this monthly planner and put it into my iCalendar, which is just my weekly calendar. My weekly calendar, I'll actually like put in the time slot. So maybe, you know, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. I'll do something or like 10 a.m. to 2 and then 2 to 4 is something else. So it's kind of this just like cascading form of monthly planner, weekly planner and making yourself stick to that. I've also been looking into co-working spaces because I do find sometimes it's easier to create that structure in your mind if you like physically leave your apartment and go somewhere else. In general, the issue with being self-employed is that we are so used to external deadlines in the normal corporate setting and external deadlines no longer exist. So the idea is to self-impose deadlines as if they were external and make them seem and feel as external as they were before. So things like leaving your apartment, like making sure you're at a certain place for a certain meeting and having things calendared as if there were someone else expecting it to be done can be really helpful. Maybe you can like ask your partner, ask your mom, ask someone else who is self-employed. Like there is kind of like an accountability thing. And I actually think accountability, ooh, accountability partners are great for this. So if you can like find some kind of community online, I know there's like freelancer communities it can be really helpful for like imposing structure onto self-employment. And for the motivation factor, I am pretty big on like five-year plans, 10-year plans, total career goals. So I like sat down, like Marie Kondo told me to, and I wrote down my ideal lifestyle. I made five-year plans um, according to uh, that book that I kept on talking about, right? Uh, the Designing Your Life worksheets, the Odyssey plans, and those were really, really helpful too. And I just look at those throughout like the week whenever I'm feeling kind of down, whenever I feel like I don't know what's going on and I don't know what to do, I will sit and look at those. So however you like to do it, whether it's like vision boards, Pinterest, quotes, whatever you can look at to remind yourself of what you are doing like you want something that the moment you look at you're like you feel motivated and I'm sure there's something that did motivate you in the first place or else you wouldn't be working at all right and if you don't know what is motivating you then that's when I'd say like take a step back and kind of think about what you enjoy doing and where you want your life to really go for me, the biggest motivation is always the future. And I think when the future doesn't seem bright and full of possibility anymore, that's when I lose motivation. But as long as I have something that I'm looking forward to and I feel like there is boundless possibility and like boundless opportunity, that's when I'm the happiest and I'm like 
totally willing to slog through whatever comes at me if I know that there is like this ultimate larger thing. Okay, the next category of questions is life strategies. The first question is about handling racism, sexism, and being othered by peers at an elite university. So unfortunately, this is kind of just a reality of elite spaces and predominantly white spaces, which includes elite spaces. And my strategy, which I don't know if it's a good one, is to pick and choose your battles. If speaking up will make a difference, especially for someone else, I would say like speak up. But I am very driven by self-preservation, probably to a fault. So if speaking up or doing something might harm me, I really don't say much and like think about it more as something to keep in my reserve, in my head, right? Like this happened, let me remember it, let me not forget that this happened. And then use whatever like racism, sexism, like being othered experience as motivation to do better, right? In general, I am a very revenge driven person, so I don't really forget when things happen to me, but I like to use that as fodder really as motivation to keep on striving, keep on trying to succeed until I get to a place where I can talk about these like experiences of being othered in college and law school at law firms and have it actually matter and be able to change the system. So I have always been of the mind that when being othered does happen to you, it is painful. It is incredibly isolating. So the idea is to find other people like find your group find your tribe like find the people that may also be experiencing that and help each other feel less alone and then as a group like don't seek revenge or anything but remember those incidents and then help channel the hurt the isolation um man I feel like I'm getting like a little messy just like thinking about those again but just like remember those just as fuel fuel for going about your life and like succeeding in things so that you one day can make a change when the opportunity presents itself, right? I do have younger friends though who are quite vocal about these things, which I honestly love. Uh, I would like to think that times are changing and it actually is acceptable to speak up on these like othering experiences every time they happen without any repercussions. But I was always like a little bit more reticent about rocking the boat because I felt like if I rocked the boat, then I would get kicked out of the boat. And I was in such a stage of my life that I needed to remain in the boat. Like I was like, I will be, you will have to like pry my cold dead hands from the boat, even if I'm like thrown overboard, like I was just going to stay on. Okay. Next question is about when to call it quits in your long-term relationship. So I actually probably usually fall to the other side of this where I normally focus too much on the long-term relationship aspect, even in the very early days of dating. So I would probably call it quits like immediately if like within two weeks I was like, well, do you want to get married? And they're like, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'd be like, no, we're done. We're done. So moving back from that, I'm don't be me. Like I do think that made dating very not fun for me. And I think dating should be fun. But when you are in a long-term relationship and you're kind of like, man, should we call it quits? You kind of have to ask yourself, like, you know, do you see yourself committing to this person? It doesn't necessarily have to be marriage, but some kind of like commitment. If you can't, then maybe don't commit anymore. And it is time to like call it quits. The second thing to ask is like, do your values not align in some fundamental way? I think values driven dating is something that we don't really emphasize in society because it's not really emphasized in romantic comedies, but values based dating is probably where I would say I wish I had done more of because oftentimes I would like wait for that fluttery feeling or whatever when at the end of the day, it's not so much that it's just about like, do your values when it comes to like money, religion, um, what you want to do for fun, uh, work, all of those things like really matter because creating a life with someone is like meshing all of those together. And if those values don't align in some like fundamental way that you can't get over, that's also probably not a great sign for long-term viability. And I think the third thing to consider is does your partner respect, value, and give you what you need? If you feel like they respect you, value you, and give you what you need, then like you're in a great position. But if you feel like any of those things are missing, like maybe you want to be with someone who values you for the thing that you value in yourself, right? I think this, I mean, I talked about this a few weeks ago, but it can be very common for your partner to potentially like you because you're like, nice, 
and pretty, right? And you're like, okay, that's nice, but I actually want to be valued for something else. Like I see my value in this relationship as something else. And that's also going to cause tension like somewhere further down the line eventually. Um, It could be fixed, like you can communicate that, but it's also not like the greatest foundation to build your relationship on. The biggest thing when it comes to knowing when to call it quits in a long-term relationship, I think, is just to not fall victim to the sunk cost bias, which is the idea that, oh, because we've already invested so much, like, we should probably just stay in the relationship. And to really think about, like, going forward, whether you will get a lot of out of being this relationship and whether your partner will get a lot of out of being in a relationship with you. No matter how long you've been together, um, think a little bit more like four. Like, are you excited about being with this person? Can you see yourself spending your life with this person? And if not, it's probably not a great sign and you should kind of call it quits. Okay, last category, which is just personal questions. The first question is kind of long and I do want to read it in its entirety because I think it's actually good context for everything. You said that you used to be a Republican when you were younger, and I wanted to know what experiences made you shift positions. I used to think of myself as a very progressive person in middle school and high school. I was, in fact, a very annoying teenager, weren't we all, Um, when actually I just watched a lot of BuzzFeed uncritically and repeated the points made in their videos. Last year, after starting university, I felt almost a pull towards more conservative positions, not because I was particularly convinced of them, but mostly out of a desire to distinguish myself from the positions of my classmates, Paren, a desire that looking back mainly stemmed from wanting to create a reason for the loneliness I felt. If I was so different from everyone else, then it was understandable that I couldn't make friends, close Paren. Which by the way, that is an amazing moment of self-awareness that you should be really, really proud of yourself for like seeing that in yourself now. I think that is like, I don't know. It's, it's just an awareness that I think you should be proud of and not a lot of people have. Continuing. However, even now that I stopped feeling that pull, I definitely feel like it's more difficult to embrace more progressive positions rather than conservative ones because progressive positions require you to decenter yourself and recognize that there are people with very different experiences, structurally disadvantaged people, and that at least in my case, some of what I have accomplished isn't because of what I did, but because of something out of my control. Anyways, this is to say that I would be interested in knowing how you changed your views because I think that for me, it would be a rather difficult process. For me, I think it was two core things that made me more progressive. One was going to law school and taking classes that really critiqued the structures of our society and critiqued like the foundations of how our society was built. And the second was dating Nathaniel, who really has been like a lifelong progressive. I think I also struggled with this idea of like, if I recognize that there are a lot of circumstances and luck involved in my success, then that would take away from my success. But I do think that you can hold those two thoughts at the same time, right? Like maybe your outcome in life is like 90% circumstances and luck and 10% what you did. But I don't think that like discounts the 10% agency that you had. Like you still had agency in all of that. Just like I think everyone has that 10% agency and everyone should be proud of that 10% agency that you have, even if you don't have control over this like 90% circumstances and luck. I think being able to embrace this, like being proud of the 10% agency while recognizing the 90% circumstances luck, being able to hold those ideas both in your mind really helped me know that just because a lot of the progressive conversations center around this like 90% circumstances luck part, it doesn't take away from the accomplishments that I've done. And in fact, really does go to show that maybe if I had different circumstances, even greater luck, I might even be like, better in terms of outcomes, right? I don't think in general, it's good to have outcome oriented perspectives. Underlying a lot of these fears is assigning morality or like goodness or like how hard of a worker someone is to the outcome, right? Like we kind of want to think that, oh, because my outcome was good, it means that I am a moral good person because I worked so hard. And like, yes, that kind of can be true, right? But it doesn't mean that if you didn't get into a certain college that you're somehow like a less moral, less deserving person in the world. So really separating out the like outcomes of what you have with like your morality, your like worth as a human being, I think is really helpful, which is really hard because I think a lot of Western society, particularly given how individualistic we are and how a lot of the people who do have like outlier results, right? Like 
Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, I'm sure that they would say that they are responsible for a lot of their success. And to a degree, they did contribute to their success. But are there other people in the world who, with the same circumstances and luck, could have done the same? Absolutely. I think what also helped me was in law school at Harvard, there was this sense of, oh, you got into Harvard. Do you know what that means? And then, of course, this like progressively more assigning value to a person based on what they achieved. One of my law creator friends, Alex Sue, he said that in his first year, everyone thought he was dumb, like he was treated like an idiot by all of his class. And then he made law review and then they started being nice to him. Maybe they thought he would be useful to know later on. But I think on some level, they actually saw him as like a better human, like a more moral human when he made law review, which is kind of like a really dumb position to take. I think his like value as a human being shouldn't be based upon whether he made law review or not. But in our society, there's like such this assignment and intertwining of outcomes and achievements with then moral desert, uh, which is just like what we think we deserve morally. I really got upset with that in law school. Like I did think you know, it's great that we all went to Harvard, but I don't think it made us a better person than anyone else. I don't think it made us better than the people who didn't get in. I think given other circumstances, luck, like maybe the admissions officer one day was just in a bad mood. Like there are so many contributing factors to outcomes that the more I recognize that and didn't want to really live in a world where we do tie outcomes to like an indication of how hard you worked, a system where we all have human worth and recognize that other people have human worth, even if they don't have the same outcomes as we did. And when I was thinking about this question, I actually found an MIT technology review article about how much of like wealth accumulation is due to intelligence and how much of it is due to things like luck. So I'll drop it below. And the next question is, what advice would you give to someone who wants to take a similar path as yours? So now that we've talked about like circumstance and luck being like 90% of your outcomes, I would say that what benefited me is increasing my luck entropy. I talked to a lot of people. I genuinely try to get to know people and I always kept an eye out for opportunities and was like trying to prepare myself mentally, emotionally, and financially to seize upon opportunities should they present themselves. Oftentimes I think it's easy to you know, not go to that party, not go to that networking event, like don't reach out to that person that you kind of were interested in getting to know. And I try to like force myself to get over that because the only way to get more opportunities in life is to get out there and increase your entropy when it comes to meeting people, um, being lucky, all of that. And it doesn't really happen so much if you like don't do anything new especially for writing, which is such an unpredictable career, right? A lot of it is just based upon being able to understand people, being able to like interact with people, being able to think about people. And you can do all of this even if you're an introvert, right? Like, I don't think there's an advantage to being extroverted or introverted when it comes to law or writing. I think they are just like different starting frameworks and you can kind of like use the benefits of introversion or extroversion for select parts of it. Okay, next question is, how did you develop the ability or confidence to be this transparent online? Part of it is just, I remember being so confused by things in law school. Like I would ask associates what billing 2000 hours meant. And then they'd be like, you know, it's a lot. And I was like, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean? And I used to think that maybe it was hard to explain or it was hard to describe. But then when I started working, I realized, oh, it's actually not that hard to describe. Just no one really does it. So I found it really frustrating that there seemed to be so much information about what it was like to be a lawyer, what it was like to go through law school that just wasn't shared online. I didn't really see the point of hiding the ball. And I honestly kind of thought hiding the ball, hiding like the invisible rules, right, that govern certain parts of our society, that just disservices first gen lawyers and immigrants more generally, like people who aren't ensconced in the rules of that society already. And despite all that I share online, like I really don't share everything. I am pretty careful in discerning like what I share online and what I don't. Sometimes I think the things I share online seem like really scary to share or like too transparent. And I have gotten comments like that about like, oh my God, how could you ever share that? And I think it seems that way, but I feel really comfortable sharing things once I have come to terms with those events, right? Like once I have fully processed those events in my head such that they are like firmly in the past. In general, 
I think it's really easy to talk about things that happened in the past when they don't evoke something now and or when they don't implicate something now. And that way I find it really easy to talk about things with my parents because my parents and I have since ironed things out and really come to a place where we understand each other and I know why they did the things they did and they have a thought about how they raised me and those things as well. I think if we hadn't gotten to that clarity, gotten to that understanding, I would feel so uncomfortable talking about just the immigrant tensions that come with growing up in America. But because we got to a good place, it just seems like, hey, it doesn't hurt me to talk about. It doesn't seem scary to share. And it might help someone else work through their own feelings. So there, there we go. And this is also why in my PhD rejection video, it took me like a couple weeks really in between having that event, right? Getting rejected and then actually being able to sit down in front of the camera and talk to y'all about it. It did take me a few weeks to process everything, to talk to other, other people about it. But by the time I sat down to make that video, it had been like fully processed in my head and fully was in the past. So it wasn't scary to like touch anymore. A lot of it is, thinking about the event in my head and if it still feels like uncomfortable to broach, uncomfortable to think about, uncomfortable to talk about, then I realize I probably need more processing. I should probably write about it more, maybe talk to friends about it more. But there does come a time when you have like fully processed something so much that it comes in this like neat little package. And in this like neat little package, you can look at it directly in the face without it scaring you. And it's that moment that I think then you're ready to share things. And it could be something that does seem like too scary to share or too transparent to other people, but it's because they are in their own journeys for processing that thing too. Okay, the next question is actually about the podcast itself. How much prep work do I do for each podcast episode and like, what does it entail? Honestly, for my researched essays, six hours on the low end and 10 plus hours on the high end, I would say. In the evenings, I try to do a little bit of journaling and write down three things. One I think is a win, one is like a lesson learned, and one is about tomorrow's agenda. And in the lessons learned in the earlier days when I was like doing all of this, this content sprint, one of my lessons learned was that it I need to leave six hours to research and script because I wasn't giving myself enough time in my calendar, in my iCal. I think in the beginning I was like, oh, it'll take like four hours. No, and four hours would pass and I would be like, I'm not done yet. So one of my earliest lessons learned was that it does take at least six hours to research and script these essays a lot longer than I would have thought. And it was always a little disappointing when I recorded it and then I edited it and it'd be like, you know, 18 minutes, 19 minutes. And I was just like, oh my God, that was so many hours of work for like 19 minutes of product. <sighs> In terms of what I actually do for the research first, I will kind of settle on a theme. I might read some things to be like, oh, what do I really want to explore more about? But I settle on a theme and then I do do extensive Googling. Luckily, because I am a faculty member at Yale, I do get access to a lot of like academic databases and uh like publications like Wall Street Journal that I think without my academic appointment, I wouldn't have as much. So it really gives me broad reign to do a lot of research online, which I absolutely love. So a lot of it is reading articles that other people have written. And then sometimes I will even just like break out my old notes from law school. So this is especially true if it's about something about like feminism or like family law. I'll just go back to my outlines or my notes or even my readings because before I left law school, I did recycle a lot of my readings, but I also kept some of them for classes that I was like, I just loved learning this and I want to keep these like booklets for later. So sometimes I even like open up these uh, academic like printed things again and go through my notes and read them again. And that's actually really fun. It's one of the reasons I think I probably would have really enjoyed doing a PhD because I do miss learning again. And like, I do miss going to class again. Maybe when I retire, like I'll do a retirement PhD, which I think would be really fun. Okay, last few questions, and they all are pretty quick. The first one is, do I still speak Mandarin? Yes, I do still speak Mandarin, but at a five-year-old's level. So the other day I ran into this lady who spoke Cantonese and she was trying to get to, I think, a government agency office. And she asked me where to go. So I looked it up on my phone and I was about to tell her in Mandarin. But for a moment I was like, oh my gosh, how do you say left and right? I hadn't spoken Mandarin so long that I was like, 左右, 
左右 ，which one is which? So that's kind of like my level of Mandarin, and I really hope that my kids have a higher level of Mandarin than me. And I'll try to encourage them to learn it by telling them that if they learn Mandarin, then they can just talk bad about their parents behind their parents' back. So I think that's a good motivation as any. Next question is: How has my life changed since I got verified on Instagram and TikTok? Um, yeah, not at all. Nothing in my life has changed whatsoever. And that's all for this week. I hope you enjoyed this more unscripted episode. I really was deeply uncomfortable every second of it because if I talk for too long off the cuff, I have this like out of body experience where I see myself talking from above, and then I'm like, it's so weird that I'm talking, you know. If you enjoy this podcast, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. And I'll give you a shout out on next week's episode. And also, get ready for、uh, the season's final episode next week, where I will be talking about drumroll here, selling out. I'll see you next time.